to his thoughts. And I've run into this. I've run into this when people fall into the trap of so many the Lord told me's. But when I hear so many the Lord told me's and some of the things coming my way are not backed up according to his word, the Lord did not tell you that. It's your own mind wanting your own way to do what you want to do because he's not going to tell you anything that's not according to his word. I don't care how much you flower it up. Don't fall for the trap. Be very cautious in knowing the Lord told you. And if you wonder, you get in his word. Because he will tell you. He will show you. It'll come from his word. Every time it'll match. Something somewhere in there will connect. So Ephesians 5, 15 through 21 says it like this then in regards to what I just said. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So it takes a, it takes a place in time. It tells us of the days that we're in. There's an understanding that I understand the times you're in. There's this, it's the days of evil and struggle, things you don't understand, things you wish were different. But live your life before me so that you can take, it, the, uh, take advantage of every opportunity that I will give you. And knowing it's from him. Verse 17, therefore do not be, fool, do not be foolish but, and understand what the Lord's will is. So understand that there is the Lord's will in this. I know the days are evil. I know that he has a will for my life in this. So there's an understanding that, is that I need to remove myself and trust him. Verse 18 says, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. There's a big word. I don't know how many times I read that word before I finally said, what the word the world does that debauchery mean? I don't want to be debauching. I mean, I've got bocce ball in the backyard and stuff like that, but, I do, but, but debauchery? Okay. Debauchery is this. Leading someone away from another person whom he or she has an allegiance or duty. Do not get drunk with wine, but be led by the Spirit, or you'll lead somebody away from an allegiance or alliance that I have with a Savior in my life and a call of God that he's given me, the great commission that he's given to all of, man, all of mankind. Oh, I wonder what the Lord's will is to call for my life. He gave us the great commission to give the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave that to every man and woman who knows Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. The great commission above anything else is to make sure you're giving them Jesus. And anything else is pulling you from it from that allegiance or duty to him is debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, it says next. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know we have an issue with thanks sometimes, but it's so important to be intentional about your thanks and remembering what God has done for you, how faithful he's been to you and your family, the times he was there for you when you weren't even faithful to him. And he's got you to where you're at today, sitting here listening to a message. Here you are. Thinking, I don't even deserve this, and yet I'm here and I'm still standing and I'm listening and God got me through it. Man, give him thanks. Give him praise. So move to John chapter 4. Jesus himself shows us that there are times of stopping. He goes out of his way. He's in, in Samaria and he goes to the well. But he goes to the well in the hot of the day, out of his way to a place where he shouldn't even be going, and Jesus sits down and he rests. He's still. He's not frantically moving about, but he is about his father's business. And so he's going out of the way to meet somebody right where they're at. What a beautiful thing that the Lord meets you right where you're at. And he meets a woman there who doesn't know it yet. She's coming in the middle of the day. 
because she has so much shame in her life. She's outcast in her town. She's made so many wrong decisions that nobody wants to even be seen with her. And she knows that about herself. But she doesn't know how to break free. So she makes her way to the well in her shame in the middle of the day. And who's there waiting for her? But Jesus. When she left that day, she didn't know she was taking her last walk of shame. And Jesus meets you in your last walk of shame. That may be somebody here today. You showed up because someone asked you, but you just grabbed a seat. But you realize that Jesus met you here in your last walk of shame because he's going to make all things right. Boy, do you need some refreshing? I do. There's some dialogue that takes place and Jesus answers her and says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Everyone that drinks this water will be thirsty again. Do you hear that? Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. That's implying this is another water. Whoever drinks this water is going to be thirsty. She's there because she's in the middle of the day. She has, to, she has to go to the well to get the water that she needs for the day to even go on, but it has to be the time that is when nobody goes because nobody moves this in the, the hot of the day, but that's protection for her, so she's not going to be ostracized by everybody around her. But this water that's going to sustain you You'll still be thirsty when you're done. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What did he just say? <laughs> There'll be a different water that's going to well up from the inside of me and bring eternal life. You need to get into this section and just read it for yourself in John 4. I don't have time to read it all for you, but you're looking for a little devotional, just read John 4. In John 7, 37 through 38, it says this, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said with a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So there it is. How many of you have run everywhere in life? So there's been a point in your life where you ran everywhere possible to find something to fulfill you, to sustain you. There's a, a piece of you that was looking for something, and you ran frantically throughout the earth to fill that in some way, some of the worst, awful places, places you would never want any of us to know that you went and you did, and things that you've done to fill the emptiness within you. And you got, when you woke up in the morning, you were still empty. Jesus has come to me, and you'll never thirst again. And rivers of living water will flow. You mean the answer will live inside of me? Yeah, they'll flow from you. Streams of living water will flow from you. Jesus gets a hold of you and he, he, inside your spirit, and you pour yourself into him. And what flows out of you, what used to be negative, what used to be against God, what used to be all kinds of filth and thoughts and things that just constantly berated you, the spirit of God comes in you and he flows like a fountain of joy from inside of you for who he is. And the message on your heart changes. And you're no longer just content doing the ways of the world. In fact, there's a conscience that comes alive with you. I can't, even, I can't even enjoy the things I used to do. Because the Spirit of God is in you, and he's that welling up is forcing all that's just pushing you. Have you ever put something in, have you ever had a dirty glass you just put in the sink and you just keep the water flowing over? What happens? Everything just keeps flowing up, and you can have coffee in the bottom of that thing, and you first, the water first hits it, it just all turns brown. But you keep that water under the faucet, it just keeps running. It flows out, flows out, flows out. But pretty soon, you got a clear glass of water. What, what, what happened? <laughs> it stayed under the fountain. And the fountain cleansed it. And Jesus says, I am the living water. I'll cleanse you. I'll make you whole. I'll make you new. The streams of living water will flow from you. Man, 
I need that desperation in my life. So as I look at someone and they tell me that they're thirsty, I give them a drink. I give them a different kind of drink than I used to. I give them a drink of Jesus. See, it's a different kind of thirst, isn't it? You see that thirst. You see that desperation of, what do I need in my life? Oh, I know what you need. I love when they ask me that question. What do I need? I know what you need. You need a drink of the living water. You need Jesus. In fact, when I tell them that, you don't even have to like me. You don't even have to know me. You just need to know him. And boy, what happens is he starts to flow in you when you surrender to him. 1 Timothy 6, I grabbed that verse out of the middle of it that just said for a moment. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You remember that verse? But godliness with contentment is great gain. What's around it? What's around that piece of scripture, that short verse? 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 12. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy and strife and malicious talk and evil suspicions and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means of financial gain. We see this. People are just like living for the debate, living to constantly just want to just... And what, what the scary part is that sometimes even people that I know that know Christ fall into this trap. They're just constantly looking for the debate, constantly looking for struggle. Con look, it says right in here that they're looking for malicious talk and evil suspicious and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth. They've been robbed of the truth so it's greater that we love them in Jesus' name. I'm not trying to just constantly debate you. When people, I've had people come to me that just have been, over time, just constantly looking for the debate, constantly think they're right, always just trying to find the next argument to being right. And there comes a point in time with, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm at peace with who the Savior is. I know, I know that I'm already right. <laughs> it's not up for debate. So are you here willing to listen to the message of the gospel. Do you really want to know? Or do you just want to have a, a constant fight all the time? I'm not up for it. But are you looking for the truth? Are you searching? And there's a difference when they're searching. Oh, I want to sit down and show them and talk to them and tell them who Jesus is. But then, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What does that look like? Self-promotion, self-plaudits, and posters, and red carpet treatment. Does that sound like Jesus? If I'm pushing me and my agenda and my name and my notoriety and my fame, does that sound like Jesus? No. Verse 11 says this, but you, men of God, you, people of God. This is Timothy's charge, but this is to us. You, men of God, flee all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called when you were made, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Take hold of the eternal life that God has given you. Flee these things and take hold of the eternal life that Jesus Christ has given you. Are you saved? 
Do you know the Savior? Does heaven wait for you because you know Jesus saved you and cleansed you from your sin and made you whole? Do you know that for sure with all of your spirit and might? Do you know it to be true in your life? Then take hold of it and live it and say it and share it. That's the message. I'm not looking for something else to do that I would be famous or known or understood. I hope nobody ever knows my name. But then they would know that I don't know who he is, but he said you need Jesus. The name of Jesus, do you know him? So let your mind be in him. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, excuse me, who in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant, a bond servant is a willing servant who, could, who has the freedom to leave but says, no, I willingly am serving. I willingly am following the city. I willingly am here. I have that stamp upon me and I'm with you heart and soul. Taking the form of a bond servant, coming into the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Obedience and humility, and bowing down before the Savior. Therefore, God did something. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name, that the name of Jesus every knee would bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the God the Father. The name of Jesus, he gave him that name. But he's the only name. There is no other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus. Amen. Don't let anybody fool you that there's other religions with other names, other gods that everybody's serving. It's all going, we're all going to the same place. We just have different names that we call him. That's a lie of the enemy. It's not an arrogant call. It's a call of who Jesus is, that he is the only name under heaven and given among men by anybody that can be saved. He's the only one who conquered death and walked out of the grave. He's the only one who reigns supreme in glory and is coming back for us. He's the only one. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.26, I'll start there. Brothers and sisters, think what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. I'm reading this section because sometimes we think we've got to be something first. Just the way you are in Christ, he wants to do an amazing work in you. There's no royalty in this room, yet God wants to use all of us. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus and has become for us the wisdom of God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Take me out of it. Take I out of it. If there's anything good in you or me, it's because of him. If I'm going to make it through what I'm going to face, it's because of him. He gets all the glory. You keep giving him praise for those, little, those victories in your life, and you watch him continue to honor you as you praise him for every detail of your life. And so it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved, I firmly determined to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ 
and him crucified. I know nothing else. I'm not trying to push another agenda, another thing, another topic, another way to just chase after what will look like this godly thing. And I got all this going on. And, oh, watch me, watch me, watch me. I guess, no, I'm not, none of that. I know Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. That's my cry, that you would know him better, that you would trust him with everything, that you wouldn't wait another day to surrender all your life to him, that you wouldn't allow him the opportunity to, to begin to work his will in your life every opportunity that he's given you. How does that happen? My closing verse. Repent. Acts 3.19 Repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Do you need a time refreshing? I see why the Lord took so much of this away and said, just end with times of refreshing. But how does it happen? I repent. I turn from my wicked ways. I call on a Savior. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I turn from my sin. And times of refreshing will come to you from him. I pray that touches your heart today. I pray the Lord ministers to you today. I pray that Job 37, 14 will be the same thing that the Lord will speak to you. He said to Job, listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Stop and consider what he's done for you. Stop and listen. Be still and know. Surrender it all to him and times of refreshing will come to you. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so thankful that we can stop before you, that we can be still. Lord, I pray against all the frantic pace that has been going on in people's lives. They never intended it to happen, Lord, but it just did. And we need moments like these to stop and to listen and to hear, to really hear and to change our hearts, Lord. I pray there'll be a, a turning to you in this place today, a trusting in you like never before, a surrendering to you, a humbleness, a bowing down, a being still and knowing that you are God. I pray, God, that you have been honored in this place today and blessed. And Lord, I say thank you for using us. Thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for being our counselor and our guide. And so we leave here today, Lord, with confidence and praise. And we lift your name on high. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his great name. Surely goodness, surely mercy, Right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever and bless your holy name. You prepare a table right.
the arrow flies and the terror of night is at my door I'll trust you Lord surely goodness surely mercy right beside thank you for that this morning, Lord. How good you are to us, even through our struggles and our pains, Lord, that we just walk with you each and every day, Lord. As we go about this week, Lord, that we see your presence in our lives each and every day and every moment that we face, Lord. We just thank you for this morning and your spirit in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.